Greetings everyone, this is Mrs. Baker and we're going through the key for The Wife of Bass Tale from Canterbury Tales and we're using your paper copy translated by Neville Coghill. Please mark up the text as I have so have your colored pencils, your pens, and your highlighters ready. So the opening of this begins with uh, the prologue to The Wife of Bass Tale and this is just an excerpt. This is the conversation that is going on between the partner and the wife of Bath. I've marked the partner in yellow and the wife of Bath in pink. And you can see, just looking at this visually, that it is the wife of Bath who loves to talk the most and is controlling the conversation here. So make sure again, I'm going to reiterate this, to mark up a complex text and to chunk it up, use your punctuation marks. So to check for the conversation, I'm going to look for those obvious cues of like he said, she said, and use my punctuation marks. So I can see that like, okay, so the she said starts here at line seven and continues all the way down to line 21. If I use that starting quotation mark and keep going until I find the end quotation mark, it gives me a good chunk. And then I can color code it accordingly so I have a nice visual using the colors of who is speaking when. So with this conversation, Pretty much the main point of it is that the wife of Bath believes that marriage is the best kind of marriage is the one where the woman rules. Now this is going to be opposite of what the partner or anyone else thinks in medieval times because it's a male dominated society. So we have um, down here he tells the partner says to her go on as you began tell us your tale spare not for any man instruct us younger men in your technique. This is definitely snarky. He is being sarcastic, um, you know, and especially when he says younger men, he's giving a jab at her age. And um, she says, well, gladly, if you'll let me speak, so stop interrupting me, okay? We also know that she is educated, um, especially when we get into her tale and all the illusions that she makes. We have um, Plemi here, who is a famous astronomer, mathematician from ancient Egypt. And she keeps telling them, well, go find, you know, go read things, go find it. I give you a little starting point here, and you should be able to go read elsewhere. Um, you know, the fact that she has to mention these things makes you wonder um, how well educated is her audience that is listening to her tale. All right, so finally getting into the tale itself. We begin here with um, good King Arthur ruled in ancient days, a king that every Briton loves to praise. Now this is a setting very familiar to the audience. They love King Arthur, so she is definitely appealing to their sensibilities, and she knows her audience will like a tale set during this time. If you like to read books or enjoy the King Arthur uh, mythology, there's so many contemporary books out there that are set during this time period. Some of my favorites, um, The Mists of Avalon is one of my all-time favorites, so I highly recommend you checking it out. Um, Avalon High is, uh, I guess it's kind of young adult. What it does is it takes um, the King Arthur myth and it sets it in a modern high school. So could be interesting. Um, something definitely I want to check out. Okay. Now in this opening section, she describes the fairies uh, and how there is no longer much fairy folk around because of Christianity. What she's showing here is uh, the conflict between Christianity and paganism. Uh, you know, Christianity has taken over. The holy friars have purged the air. Um, they've been everywhere, blessing the halls, the chambers, the kitchens, the cities, the boroughs. They're everywhere, even in the outhouses and the dairies, you know, in the barn. There's everywhere that um, Christianity has taken over. And so the old religion is out with the new one in. We also can see, too, that um, there's a bit of um, women versus the church here because women are powerful, um, can be powerful. You know, she, the wife of Bath, is a um, very dominant type personality, and this can be threatening to those in the church who want it to be male dominated. Okay, so she continues here in lines 47 all the way down to 56. She's continuing to criticize the church and at one point even calls friars an incubus um, that they break the vows of chastity and they prey on women. You know, um, again, the church is supposed to be, you know, um, 
very moral, yet so often there are examples of immorality occurring within the church. And an incubus is a demon. So, yeah, she says, you know, here comes the church. It's really not a good thing. All right, so now we get back to the tale. She tells us, um, you know, gets to the plot of her story here being set in King Arthur's time. We have um, an example in line 59 of alliteration with lusty liver. Um, it also makes you wonder, like, should it be lover instead? But you can see with the rhyming couplets that liver rhymes with river. So they want to keep the rhyme scheme. Okay. Now, with her tale, we have a knight... The main character is a knight who is not chivalrous, and he rapes a maiden that he finds, um, you know, walking by the river. And at first, after the people petition to the king, he decrees that he will lose, the knight will lose his own head and be beheaded. Um, now, I've marked this up again, you know, kind of color coding it so you can see um, the chunks, because we don't have as much dialogue in this but to try to show you the different pieces of um, the tale and what is occurring. Now the queen steps in and decides it would be better to teach the knight a lesson, uh, that he should be allowed to live if he can provide a suitable answer to what is the thing that most women desire. And I've marked that in lines 80 uh, and 81. Okay, And you have her speaking here. We have Queen Guinevere, that's King Arthur's queen, um, is line... 78 okay and continues all the way down to line 89 and what she gives him though is a little bit of time to research she says you have a year and a day to research and find this out to give us a sufficient answer so she's given him a stay of execution for now but he must return within that time period now it's interesting the queen decides it would be better to teach this knight a lesson rather than just kill him right off the bat. and Maybe other men can learn from his example. Okay, So the knight, we have lots of um, examples of consonants in line 89 with the uh, repetition of the S sound, sad, was, sorrowfully, sighed, lots of S's in there. And the knight begins his quest. And this is a common motif of any knight story. Um, the most famous one of all is the, the quest for the Holy Grail. And here we have this knight begins a quest also for something that's a, an age-old answer. People want to know what do women most want. Okay, so going from lines 95 on down, he knocked at every house, he searched all over the place, and he um, went here, there, and everywhere and could not find uh, people that would agree on the answer. And we have lines 100, about 101, all the way down, um, to about line 124, we have all of these different examples of what people have said. And we also get an explanation of how these answers aren't necessarily correct. Okay, In line 117, uh, actually it's more like one, sorry, 118, you try it out and you will find it so too. The you here, this is indicating that um, the wife of Bath is speaking to the audience, you know, who is listening to her right now, okay? Now, I've color-coded here line 127, remember Midas? Will you hear the tale? So she's, you know, I guess she's trying to pad her um, submission here for the storytelling contest because she inserts a story within her story. And she tells the tale of Midas, who was a Greek king. This is an illusion, and it comes from Ovid, um, Greek mythology, 